Hey everybody, this is Mr. Malvin coming at you with another A Push video. This is our fourth video of taking a look at topic 8.4, uh, the U.S. economy from 1945 to 1980. Now, uh, previously we've talked about how the U.S. economy, as it was defined for the most part, especially in the 1950s and 1960s after World War II, was a time of tremendous economic expansion, new opportunity. Uh, you know, real wages are going up significantly. There's a lot more disposable income that's going to help, you know, kind of add jet fuel to the economy. Uh, and there's clearly, without a doubt, uh, no debate that America is the number one nation in the world, at least economically. Uh, but as we get into the end of the 1960s and much more so in the 1970s, that sense of American economic omnipotence is going to start to fade. It's going to, there's going to start to be some, you know, tarnishing of this gleaming American economy. It's going to come under some tremendous challenges uh, that will define mostly the 1970s. So let's get into that. Now, uh, following the Johnson presidency of the 1960s, we will see Richard Nixon become president. Uh, and even though we mostly think of Nixon for either the Watergate scandal or a lot of uh, Cold War foreign policy stuff, you know, Vietnam, detente, stuff like that. But domestically, you have to understand that, you know, Nixon is going to be bringing some degree of conservative values to uh, the nation's economic policy issues. Now, note, some degree of conservatism, meaning he's more conservative, I'd say, than Eisenhower, but when we get into Reagan in the next unit, not definitely not as conservative as Reagan and certainly would not be considered all that conservative by modern standards, but still, though, somewhat conservative. An example of this is a support for what's going to be known as new federalism. Uh, federalism is the relationship that exists between the federal government and the states. And that relationship had become stronger and stronger since the advent of the New Deal in terms of the federal government having more and more say in terms of what the state and the local governments will do. Uh, and, and that's a concerning thing for many Republicans and those that, you know, fear big federal government stuff. And so what new federalism is talking about is basically taking the benefits of a federal government's money and resources and then giving those states that freedom and the ability to dictate how that money is done or how that money is spent rather. And this comes in the form of what we call block grants. A block grant is when the federal government says, hey, you know, we're going to be awarding money to states for educational purposes. Okay, you know, let's say Ohio, here's, you know, uh, $50 million. Okay, uh, traditionally the federal government might say, okay, we want you, the state of Ohio, to spend this money on textbooks and computers. Uh, the state of Ohio might say, well, you know, that's nice and all, but we have a bigger problem with not having enough kids getting enough food to eat on a daily basis. So we'd rather spend it on that. Now, if the federal government is imposing its will, then you don't really have a say. But with block grants, the federal government gives you much more discretion on how you want to spend that money. If you want to spend that money in education on textbooks and computers, cool. You want to spend it on teacher salaries, awesome. But if you feel your need is, you know, providing free breakfast and lunch programs, so be it. So Nixon's going to be a big proponent of that. And that's certainly part of the, the conservative playbook for, for sure today. Uh, something that's going to be interesting that Nixon's going to try to attempt is the use of impounding funds passed by Congress. Uh, the growth of the federal government's uh, welfare programs, social programs, expanded significantly during the 1960s under, Jeff, excuse me, under Johnson's uh, Great Society and War on Poverty programs. Nixon wants to scale that down, especially since the Vietnam War has become very, very burdensome financially. Uh, and so Nixon's going to use his power as, as a chief, chief executive to basically not enforce the funding legislation to keep you know, these programs funded at that same level. Well, Democrats are going to file suit saying that you know, when the president refuses to enforce the funding laws, that the president is actually violating separation of powers. And the Supreme Court's going to agree. Uh, the court's going to find that Nixon's attempt to impound funds is unconstitutional because if the president knowingly refuses to spend funds that's been passed by Congress, then that's the president acting in a legislative way. He's basically dictating what the law is going to be. And that's Congress's job, 
not the president. Uh, but if that was going to be the biggest problem for uh, Nixon uh, domestically, that, would be, that wouldn't be too bad. But there's going to be a lot of problems domestically for Nixon, and that's even above and beyond all the stuff going on with Watergate. Economically, things are going to start to go downhill and go downhill noticeably. One of the big things that's going to define the Nixon presidency, and really the 1970s here at home, is going to be problems with what we call stagflation. Stagflation is a really nasty combination of having an economic recession or, or down period, and that's characterized by you know growing, raising unemployment rates, but at the same time, high inflation. Uh, so prices are going up quickly and wages are not able to come up. So it's a really horrible situation. You know, it's, it's the worst of a bad economy and the worst of a good economy at the same time. Uh, and so basically, it was harder to become a job. And, and even if you did have a job, your pay was not keeping up with inflation. So that was becoming a major problem. The buying power, which was so big and so robust in the 1950s and into the 1960s, was now being eaten away pretty dramatically due to a poor economy. Nixon tries to step in with a creative effort that would impose a 90-day freeze on wages and prices. The idea being is that at least on the inflation side, if you put in this artificial freeze, it will then cool down the economy and therefore cool down inflation. Uh, but unfortunately, once those freezes have been taken, once they're taken away after 90 days, well, then the inflation goes right back up again. So it didn't really cool down the economy in a real way to offset the inflation. So stagflation is going to be a common problem. Something else that's going to be defining uh, the Nixon presidency domestically is that we will finally take the U.S. off the gold standard for good, this time on the global stage. It had already been taken off uh, the gold standard uh, domestically during the Roosevelt administration. And so now what we have completely now uh, for the U.S. dollar is that its value is now truly based on faith. Faith that the federal government's, uh, you know, good for the money, that there's faith that the government says that that currency has value. It is not purely beg, uh, based on gold anymore. Uh, now, after the Watergate scandal that will see Nixon resign from office in disgrace, we'll see his uh, vice president, Gerald Ford, become the next president. Uh, and even though it's a new resident of the White House, it's still going to be the same old economic challenges. Stagflation is going to be absolutely throwing a monkey wrench into any attempts to try to improve the economy. Now, Ford is going to try something different known as the Whip Inflation Now plan. And, you know, the best way to kind of describe this is that this is an idea of asking the American public, especially business owners, to kind of do the right thing with regards to inflation. The idea being is you know, making sure that those wages keep up with inflation uh, and keeping prices of things down if you're a business owner. And that's a little bit counterintuitive to how supply and demand works in the capitalist system. But it does, you know, kind of, it's almost like a Herbert Hoover kind of a thing, you know, in terms of you are asking the American public to do the right thing as opposed to imposing you know, the federal government's will. And it's well-intentioned and it's very nice and, you know, speaks to, you know, conservative values, but it, it doesn't really do anything to help the situation. And it, you know, pretty quickly when uh, begins to be mocked as a loss uh, for the U.S. economy. And, you know, inflation is just going to continue to eat away American paychecks. Inflation hits an annual rate of 9% under the four, under the, uh, during the Ford administration in the mid 70s, and then when he is defeated by Jimmy Carter uh, and he becomes the next president, it only gets even worse. We're going to be seeing inflation hit 13 percent under the Carter administration. So you are seeing in the 1970s, you're going to see, uh, you know, the price of things go up about 30 to 35 uh, percent, you know, pretty fast in the mid to late. 1970s and when you look at the decade in total you know from start to finish you know you're now looking at you know about a hundred percent uh you know doubling of prices so in other words you know what uh you know what a gas uh, tank of gas cost in 1970 is now double that in 1980. now there's some other factors that play a role in that but for the average American, those wages did not keep up. And so the American economy is going downhill. It's not this dramatic crash like the Great Depression, 
but it's this erosion of the 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 strength of the once you know really tremendous strength of the U.S. economy that's starting to happen. And there's some reasons as to kind of why this is happening. You know, the 50s and 60s, especially the 50s, was a time where America was pretty much you know uh, dominating at a time where we didn't we didn't really have much competition. You had global manufacturing industrial powers that were mostly rebuilding from World War II. Well, by the 1970s, that process was done. And foreign competition, particularly from Japan, was now catching up in terms of electronics, cars, all sorts of steel, all sorts of things. And so now, you know, American businesses are trying to actually truly compete on the global stage, and they're going to have to, you know, face issues of the cost of labor, the cost of shipping, and all those things that they didn't quite have to worry as much before, and now that's going to be a problem. And as that is happening, the economy on its own is becoming more globalized. In other words, you know, we are seeing a much more diversified economy where if you're an American business that's maybe, you know, you know, maybe headquartered in Oregon, you are finding raw materials in places like the Philippines and Argentina and Italy, and then assembling those things in, say, you know, Mexico and then selling those products globally. You know, the idea being is, you know, why would you, for example, have, you know, cars manufactured in Mexico if you are Ford or GM? The reason being is Ford's wages are, excuse me, uh, Mexico's wages are a lot less. Uh, unions are not nearly as protected in, a many, in many developing countries. And so, you know, by the 1970s, unions were still pretty strong. Uh, they had been able to, you know, through the recent decades, uh, be able to get higher pay, guaranteed pensions, good health care plans, which are really nice if you're a union worker, but is going to make the American product less competitive on the global stage. So we're going to be seeing, you know, globalization start to eat away at manufacturing labor jobs in the United States, which will then eat away at the power of labor unions. And just understand, you know, what had seen the 1950s see as this tremendous growth in the economy and this, you know, burgeoning sense of American greatness and, you know, uh, you know uniqueness and, and being special and, you know, being the greatest thing on earth. Now, by the end of the 70s, we don't quite have that same swagger. We, we feel like we've lost our mojo. And this is not the only thing. I mean, there's other things like, you know, the loss in Vietnam, the Watergate scandal, the Iran hostage crisis. You know, there's a bunch of things that also play in the mix in terms of why America will feel like it's lost its way. But the declining economy, the interest rates, the stagflation, that's certainly going to be playing a critical role. There's a sense that maybe we've peaked economically in our nation's history and we'll never have that sense of success ever again. And that's kind of how we're going to end that day. All right. Uh, so that's the U.S. economy from the end of World War II uh, to 1980. We'll see you next time.